Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. This is Play It Forward. Real people, real stories. The struggle to play it forward. Episode number 607 is with Reverend James Martin, author of Come Forth. Good morning. How are you? Absolutely. I've been looking so forward to this conversation because you sit down. That's so nice. Thank you. Oh, my God. You sit down with us. I mean, right here in the very part of this book, the very beginning, you you are so compassionate about who is going to read this book, a non-believer, a believer, somebody who wants to know more. And you say, I am your guide to go into this into the staircase of the tomb. And then you ask the questions. What prompted you to read this book? Why not? It's Lazarus. I mean, my whole entire life with Christianity has been based and been fed by by this man. But then you do ask, did he exist? Right there. Yeah, I do. I think it's important for people to uh, to ask that question. You know, like, you know, even doubters. Did this guy exist? Um, is it a made up story? You know, we have to start from the very beginning. And in the book, I go through a lot of the um, uh, the proofs, basically, for how we know Lazarus existed. One of the simplest ones is, he has a name. And, uh, you know, there are only a few people outside right. the apostles uh, who are named uh, in the Gospels. And, and one of the reasons uh, scholars believe that they have names is that the early church would have known them. So it's not just a man, you know, who was a leper or a poor man. It was Lazarus and Martha and Mary. So we can be I think 99% sure that these people really existed. Don't you think that our connection with Mary is that we have all been there? We have been in that moment of having no faith, but we needed leadership so that we could gain trust again? Oh, totally. Uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about Martha and Mary uh, in the book, uh, you know, in addition to Lazarus and, of course, Jesus. You know, Martha and Mary are really all of us. Uh, in that story, they're frustrated that Jesus hasn't come for their brother. You know, who among us hasn't said, you know, God, you're not working fast enough, right? right? And so I draw a lot of the parallels between Martha and Mary uh, and us, you know, in our lives, and also the invitation for us to be honest with God in our prayer. Well, what's re- what's really interesting about this story? First of all, my pastor Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church has always been about Lazarus. He's always planting the seeds from so many stories from this. And so to have this book in front of me, this this is just it, it gives me more purpose of the plan is what it does. And I can't thank you enough for this book. Well, thanks. I mean, I really you know it's such an important part of the of, of the Gospels for me, and it's always been my favorite gospel story. And I really wanted to kind of take a deep dive into it and look at it from a biblical point of view, a spiritual point of view, a cultural point of view, and even give the reader a bit of a travelogue to say, you know, what is what is current day Bethany like today? Because it's just a fascinating story. And there's not a lot about there's not a lot written about it, you know, in kind of book form. So I wanted to kind of bring it all together. Why is that? Why? Because be, be way, way, way back when I was at a Baptist church in Billings, Montana, we didn't hear of Lazarus. I mean, it, why is that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, you know, it's it's in the sort of uh, cycle of readings towards the towards the end of the of Lent. You know, yeah. uh, at least in, in the Catholic Church, and I think in other churches. So you only see it once a year. You see it mainly at funerals. People might associate it too much with death mm. uh, because they hear it at funerals a lot. So maybe it's a bit of a you know a bit of a mysterious uh, reading for them. Uh, and you know, it's something. You know, I think we can we can imagine Jesus healing people. We can imagine Jesus preaching. I think raising from the dead. It really, you know, it's a challenge for people to believe in. I mean, that is quite quite the miracle. And as I say in the subtitle to the book, you know, often called Jesus's greatest miracle. So it might be just you know, it makes demands on us. I think. Yeah. In your own personal life, do you feel uncomfortable during the moments where Jesus is taking his time? Because it doesn't matter how many times I read it or even hear it, I always feel uncomfortable because I'm going, dude. Come on, hurry, hurry up. (laughs) I I do, too. I think it's natural. I think it's human. We all want God to act on God's time. And yet, you know, as I point out in the book, especially in John's gospel, uh, Jesus is in control. Jesus will go to Bethany when he wants to go to Bethany. Um, You know, one of the reasons for the delay also is because Jewish people at the time believed that the soul was around the body for about three or four days. And so I think one of the reasons he waits you know, is to kind of show people, you know, Lazarus is dead, as he says to the Apostle Thomas, uh, and to be clear, like, what the miracle is. You know, he's not just awakening him from you know, some sort of sleep. He's definitely dead. Right. And and to see him weep. I, I can't imagine if I were a fly on the wall to actually see a tear in the eyes of Christ. I, I, I don't know how I would have handled that. 
Well, yeah, and you know what's really beautiful is that really does show his humanity. Yep. Uh, I think that's a hard thing for some people to to grasp, but you know it is a mystery. But he's fully human and fully divine, and uh, you know he he as I often say he's he's human when he's raising Lazarus, and he's divine when he's sawing a piece of wood, you know, in Nazareth. <laughs> so it is it is very mysterious, but that's a real powerful moment for a lot of people. You have traveled to the Holy Land, and the Holy Land is is right now in in just terror. And I can't help but wonder what what is it doing to us? Is it building up our inner trust that hold it? Just don't judge. Trust that there will be peace. Do you? What are you feeling since you have physically stepped on that soil? Well, yeah, and you know the story of Lazarus, uh, current day Bethany is in Palestinian territory. Oh, so I talk about that in the book and. It just it's just heartbreaking, frankly. I, I don't know what to say other than to continue to pray for peace and hope that, you know, there can be some sort of reconciliation and mutual trust, you know, among these two groups of people that have been at such odds for so long. But I think all we can do is pray for peace. One of the things that you do, and I find this very fascinating and very grateful, is the way that you break down the, the atmosphere of each person, who they are, what they did, because so many times all we get, we get a verse. And, and, and in that verse is an name and and we we don't know who that person is but you're sharing their story with us oh totally and thanks for bringing that up you know the i always say like these are real people right these are not just fictional characters that walk into a story and walk out of a story these are real people with backstories and futures and lives and so you know the gospel gives us some clues about who these people are uh, and at least how who the, what their personalities are like and so i think it's really important to say you know i always say to people jesus came in a real time in a real place and and met real people reverend maybe it's just me but at the end of each chapter there are questions and I love that because it's like, what did you learn? How did you learn it? How can we activate this? This is such a special moment between you, the author and the reader. Well, that's exactly why, because I'm the same way. I need people to, I had a, a professor in theology studies who uh, at the end of it, a, a big lecture, he used to say, so what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he would, he would sum it up and say, like, I've just given this hour lecture. Here's the point. And at the end of the book, I have these, at the end of each chapter, I have these reflection questions to basically help the reader say, like, so what? Like, what, what is this? Because the book goes step by step through the story. What does this particular passage have to do with my own life? And so I try to lead the reader to some spiritual uh, reflection. Oh, my God. And I hope that they pick up a journal of some sort and physically answer these questions. Put it in their own handwriting. Don't just think it out. Write it out. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, I also invite the reader to kind of pray with the story on his or her own, kind yes. of make, make the story your own, because the theme of the book, again, is, is that God is offering us new life, and God is, is inviting us to leave behind kind of in our own tombs, as it were, anything that keeps us unfree or bound or kind of stuck. And so absolutely, when, when something happens to you in prayer, when you have an insight to write it down, it's really important to be able to hold on to that. You know, that's why the gospel writers write the story of Jesus down. Wow. You got to come back to this show anytime in the future. I love where your heart is, and I love how you are putting yourself in a place where we can find peace during these troubled times. Thank you so much. Thank you. You be brilliant today, okay, Reverend? <laughs> you too. God bless you.